Did this world come into existence gradually over long periods of time? Is the universe billions of years old? Did the universe create itself by means of a Big Bang? Or was the world created by God in six literal days? Let's examine answers to these questions on our program today. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love And now your host for The Truth in Love, Dave Miller. Welcome to our program. Logically and philosophically, only two alternatives present themselves as possible explanations of how the universe came into being. Either matter created itself or God created it. That means that only two approaches to existence are available, creation or evolution. Evolution stakes its plausibility upon long periods of time, literally millions and billions of years required for the development of life on Earth. Thus, the age of the universe, the age of the Earth, is a critical cornerstone of evolutionary theory. Evolutionists themselves admit that without long eons of time, evolution is simply impossible. True biblical creationists, on the other hand, recognize that the Bible clearly represents the age of the earth and the universe to be quite young, in fact, a few thousand years old. The creationist believes that God created the entire universe and all life upon the earth in six literal days. Consequently, raw, organic, vertical evolution is untenable, both biblically and scientifically. Please bear with me for the next several minutes as we examine some of the evidence that pertains to these matters. Let's begin with some of the scientific evidence. The average person would surely be amazed to find so much scientific evidence which shows the universe and the earth to be too young for evolution to have taken place. This scientific evidence has been suppressed by a biased scientific community who has simply decided to accept evolutionary theory and reject the Bible and creationism. Take, for example, the receding moon. The laws of physics indicate that the moon is slowly moving away from the Earth. These laws also show that the moon could never survive a nearness to the Earth of less than 11,500 miles. That's a distance known as the Roche limit. Inside that limit, the Earth's tidal forces would literally break the moon apart. Based upon standard uniformitarian principles, which undergird evolutionary theory, if you multiply the present recession speed of the moon by the presumed evolutionary age, the moon should be much farther away from the earth than it presently is. Thus, scientific evidence shows that the moon is not as old as evolutionary theory requires it to be. The receding moon supports creationism, not evolution. Another example of scientific support for creationism is the shape of the earth. Lord Kelvin argued that the Earth's slowing spin rate proves that the Earth could not be a billion years old. A billion years ago, the Earth would have been spinning twice as fast. If the Earth were initially molten, the centrifugal force of such a high spin rate would have caused an extremely large bulge around the equator. Slow spin reduction and fast surface cooling would have solidified the bulge into a high continent that would have encircled the equator. But obviously, there is absolutely no trace of such a bulge. A third evidence of creation is seen in the depth of lunar dust. Do you remember before our astronauts landed on the moon, 
how evolutionary scientists caused great concern across our country. They insisted that since the moon was 4.5 billion years old, the rate of influx of dust and the lunar physical processes of, of rock breakup might result in the astronauts sinking into a great depth of dust on the moon. But, of course, the astronauts did not sink into deep dust when they arrived on that moon. Instead, the creationist predictions of only a thin layer of dust based on a young age for the moon were, in fact, correct. Here is a case where the bias and false predictions of evolutionary scientists posed a barrier to scientific progress. Another evidence for a young Earth is the rapid rate of decay of the Earth's main magnetic field in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics. Scientific calculations of the decay of this field have been going on since 1835. They measure about 5% per 100 years. Using the evolutionists' same methodology, if we extrapolate backwards, we come to a time when the Earth's magnetic field could have been no stronger. In fact, we reach a time where if the magnetic field had been any stronger, it would have ruptured the Earth and split it apart. That figure, the age limit of the Earth's magnetic field, is 10,000 years. Here again, we have scientific evidence that the Earth is neither millions nor billions of years old. Next, we call attention to an important finding of astrophysics. The fact that our sun is shrinking. In fact, it is shrinking at the rate of five feet per hour. Once again, if we know the sun is shrinking at that rate, and we apply evolutionary principles and work backward, adding five feet per hour to the sun's mass, we quickly come to a point where the sun would be too large for life to exist on Earth. And guess what? A few thousand years ago. The sun on this basis could not be several billion years old. Thus, creation is actually more scientifically feasible than evolution. Still another instance of scientific evidence for creation and a young Earth is seen in the work of Sir Fred Hoyle, one of the most famous astronomers in the world. Dr. Hoyle was knighted by the Queen of England because of his great scientific achievements. He pointed out a very real problem. Most of the universe is composed of hydrogen, but hydrogen is gradually being converted into helium in what appears to be an irreversible process. But Dr. Hoyle discovered that the universe remains almost entirely composed of hydrogen. But if the Earth and the universe were infinitely old, as evolutionists maintain, the universe ought to contain far more helium than it does. On the basis of his findings, Dr. Hoyle concluded that the creation issue simply cannot be dodged. In fact, he went so far as to note that asking him to believe that the spontaneous generation of life on this earth in only 4.5 billion years has produced a human being we today know as Homo sapiens is like asking him to believe that a whirlwind went through a junkyard and from the materials contained therein assembled a Boeing 747. One final item pertains to population statistics. Evolutionists believe that man has been here only about one million years. Population statisticians are people who estimate the world's population, taking into account death, famine, disease, war, etc. Using evolution's assumptions, how many people ought there to be on Earth if human beings have been here for one million years? That figure stands at 1 times 10 to the 5,000th power. That's a 1 with 5,000 zeros added on behind it. Let me attempt to give you an idea of the magnitude of that number. 
at the known estimated size of the entire universe, 20 billion light years in diameter. If you were to take people of our size and, and shape and cram them into our universe like sardines, filling the entire universe, you might barely squeeze in one times 10 to the 100th power. That leaves you with a one with 4,900 zeros left over. You can't even get them into the observable universe. If, on the other hand, you accept creationist figures, with the earth having been here some six to 8,000 years, there ought to be around five billion people on earth. I wish we had time to examine more of the scientific evidence that supports creation and conflicts with evolution. There is, in fact, a great deal more information. But we must now turn to the Bible's own claims concerning these matters. Sometimes believers in the Bible feel compelled to capitulate to the pseudoscientific claims of our day by attempting to harmonize the Bible with alleged scientific data, the propaganda pertaining to the long periods of time required for evolution has been so effectively repeated time and time again, many people think the earth has been here for billions of years. Thus, they feel the need to bend the Bible narrative in order to accommodate the evolutionary framework. But I've presented you with a small portion of the scientific evidence for a young earth. Now I want to show you that the Bible itself unequivocally teaches a young earth and a young universe. The Bible clearly maintains that the creation of the universe and everything therein was accomplished in a few days and stands in stark contrast to the evolutionary claim of billions of years. We begin in Genesis chapter 1 where we find a very simple, straightforward record of how God created the universe. We find repeated eight times the simple phrase, and God said. I invite you to open to Genesis chapter 1 and read verses 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, verse 20, 24, and 26. Eight times, and God said. In every case, God speaks into existence a certain aspect of the created order. Each time God speaks, the inspired writer very simply reports that it was done. You cannot objectively read the first chapter of Genesis without getting the distinct impression that God literally spoke the universe with all of its constituent elements into existence. Both organic and inorganic matter came into existence by the verbal command of God. Yet evolutionists would have us to believe that things were much more gradual than that. They hold that things did not just suddenly come into existence. Rather, over long periods of time, millions and billions of years, various aspects of the physical universe and the life forms within it emerged and eased into existence. In the realm of religion, liberal theologians have attempted to sidestep the clear import of the marvelous Genesis account of creation in an effort to identify themselves with the, quote, modern scientific approach. And so they have labeled chapter 1 of Genesis as a hymn or a myth. Some have insisted that Genesis 1 is actually simply a figurative description. Others have maintained that Genesis 1 is a non-scientific depiction of creation in keeping with the primitive peoples who wrote it. My response to such thinking is threefold. First of all, I have a different understanding of inspiration than those folks. I'm convinced that the Bible, though written by some 40 different writers over a period of some 1,600 years, Nevertheless, the Bible has but one author, 
the Holy Spirit, who governed each of those writers in such a way that they wrote no falsehood. A writer may not use the scientific jargon that mere men have since developed, but the biblical writer did give us a true and accurate description of what actually happened. Secondly, this chapter does not possess any of the marks of poetic or figurative language. Even if it did, poetic language does not convey fantasy and fairy tales. For example, the 23rd Psalm speaks of the Lord being a shepherd who makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's poetic imagery. I do not literally go out and lie down in a field. But notice that the imagery describes real life events. There really are sheep and shepherds and green pastures. My spiritual relationship to the Lord is compared to the physical relationship of a shepherd to his sheep. So Genesis chapter 1 is giving us a literal account of what God did in bringing the universe into existence. Far too many people, when they do not wish to accept what the Bible is clearly teaching, find it easy to just pass the Bible off by saying, well, that's just figurative. But you know, anyone who has spent a serious amount of time studying the Bible knows that such a person is simply ill-informed. Thirdly, I know that Genesis chapter 1 is intended to be taken literally because the rest of the writers of the Bible who refer to Genesis chapter 1 take it literally. Listen to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. What about 2 Peter chapter 3 beginning in verse 4? After speaking of the beginning of the creation, Peter says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. Notice that Peter is saying that the universe existed. It was as a result of God's Word. And I invite you to read Hebrews chapter 11 verses 2 and 3, which states that God, through Jesus, made the worlds. And to Jesus is given the role of upholding all things by the Word of His power. No wonder the psalmist declared, By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Read Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9, as well as Psalm 148, verse 5. No, a simple, unbiased reading of Scripture will not leave room for evolutionary theory and eons of time. Consider with me these further points. If God had wanted to communicate to us the idea that He created everything in six literal days, how else could He have conveyed that idea other than the way He did so in Genesis chapter 1? But if that chapter is not clear enough for you, and if all of these other passages of Scripture are not clear enough, I invite you to consider the fact that God Himself states that the entire created order was brought into existence by Him in six literal days. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. This chapter describes the occasion when the Ten Commandments were given by God. God imparted those Ten Commandments to the Israelite nation, including other rules and regulations that were to govern their lives. When He commanded them to observe the seventh day of the week as a Sabbath day, a day in which labor was to cease, 
God gave the following rationale. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. You can't get any clearer than that. Here is a non-figurative, non-poetic, straightforward face value declaration that God created the entire universe in six literal days. The Israelites could have understood that statement in no other way. Notice then that the human race, the first human beings on this planet, were only five days younger than the earth. The universe is only five days older than man. Jesus agreed with that assessment because in Mark chapter 10 verse 6, He explained that from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Compare that with Matthew 19, 4. That one passage alone discounts evolution, whether theistic or atheistic. Since we live in 1994, we know that from our day back to Jesus' day is 2,000 years. From Jesus' day back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 is another 2,000 years. That can easily be documented by archaeology as well as the biblical text. That only leaves from Abraham back to the creation, which is some 20 generations in the genealogies. You can read the genealogies in Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 11, 1 Chronicles chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, and then take a look at Jude, verse 14. The geneal genealogical lists given in the Bible, of course, were not intended to establish an exact age for the earth. Rather, they provide us with a substantially complete record of the lineage of Christ. So some gaps may be expected, but very few. There's absolutely no room in these lists for the millions and billions of years postulated by evolution. The lists are sufficiently complete to estimate the age of the earth at less than 10,000 years. The biblical record simply will not accommodate evolution. In a previous program, we have presented some of the evidence that warrants the conclusion God exists. In today's study, we've demonstrated both scientifically and biblically that the universe, our earth, and life itself was created only a few thousand years ago. The Bible's report of how the world came into existence is authentic and reliable, just as it is in all of its other details. The second chapter of 2 Peter serves as a fitting conclusion to our study today. Peter describes how some people would see how life on this planet appears to have just continued on unchanged for so long. They would conclude that no end is in sight, that Jesus will not return. But then in graphic fashion, Peter describes how, as a matter of fact, the universe is being reserved by God for a day in which the entire created order will be set on fire. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 2 Peter 3.10. Peter then asks us, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness? Indeed, I invite you to give careful, prayerful consideration to your own spiritual condition. The same God who spoke the universe into existence is going to completely destroy and dissolve the created order someday. Eternity will be ushered in with every human being who has ever lived being consigned to either heaven or hell. I urge you to become a Christian if you've not already done so by believing in God and His Word, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ with your mouth, and being baptized in water for the remission of sins. If you're an unfaithful Christian, do not delay your return to the Father until it is too late. Stay with me. We'll be back in just a moment.
Thank you for studying with me today. The material that I presented is available in our usual free audio cassette tape that we make available to viewers free of charge, no cost, no obligation. Today's program is also available in the form of a written transcript. If you'll write me this week at The Truth in Love, P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053, we'll be happy to send you the free audio cassette tape or the free written transcript. May God bless you as you attempt to study the Word of God and to arrive at His truth. May God bless you this coming week. Now the full revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in love and grow up unto Him. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth.